the middle of the night, in the middle of the street. And I want to talk to you about the greatness of our God. Welcome to this week's video sermon, everyone. Hey, have you ever walked outside in the middle of the night, been able to look up and see the stars and think to yourself, as you look at the stars and you think about how all of them in space, God has put them in their place. Wow, I am, I am so small. And God, you, you are so great. I wanna capture that feeling with you here today. Now, before we get into Hebrews chapter 11, grab your Bible right now and open it with me to Job 38. And to quote the, the words of my good friend, Kanye West, back when I thought the book of Job was a job, this book in the scripture is not job, it is Job. And this is such a great book for us as we go through this coronavirus crisis trial. You know, Job, I don't know if you're familiar with his story, but he was a righteous man. He was blameless in his generation and Satan comes and he appears before God and God allows Satan to test Job and Satan begins to attack Job. He attacks his property. He attacks his children. His children end up dying. Eventually, Satan attacks Job's health. And in the beginning of this trial that Job goes through, Job stands steadfast. He remains true to the Lord. He even says in Job chapter one, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then it all goes downhill when Job's three friends come to him and they open up their mouths and they start getting him to question God, which is what we can so often do when we go through trials. God, why is this happening? God, if you're good, why are you allowing these bad things to take place? And in Job 38, God finally responds to Job's questions. And look at what God says to Job. In Job 38, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Oh, surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther and here shall your proud waves be stayed. You see what God says to Job in response to his questions? God doesn't even answer Job's questions. Instead, you know what God does? He begins to question Job and he says, Hey Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you there when I set the cornerstone for the creation that I made? Like surely you know how the sea and everything that is in it was formed and fashioned. You know how all that took place, right Job? And God's trying to get Job to understand, hey, even in the midst of the trial, I am a great God. And here's what we're going to see tonight as we study Hebrews chapter 11. Our great God often uses people who aren't great to do great things so he can get the glory. Turn with me now to Hebrews chapter 11. And as you turn to Hebrews chapter 11, man, I just, I have loved studying Hebrews chapter 11 over the past couple of weeks with you guys in the United. We have learned so much about what it means to really walk by faith and not by sight. And we have studied so many different characters in depth. I remember when we looked at Abel and we talked about how God deserves our best, not our leftovers. I remember when we talked about Abraham and how he went to a land that he had never been to before because God called him and still he obeyed. And tonight, 
as we read Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to begin in verse 32 and read down to verse 34. And this, this, this writer is just going to rapid fire, give us six different characters who lived their lives by faith. And God commends them for it. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and begin with me in verse 32. It says, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me, which is my favorite phrase as a preacher of God's word. I love studying the Bible with you guys. I love getting to explain what I've learned from my own study to you guys. I love watching you as I preach because some of you guys, I can tell you really get into it and you want to understand what we're talking about. And sometimes I can literally see the light bulb, like I like to say from Despicable Me, moment happen right there on your face. Sometimes it's like literally mind blown emojis are happening right in front of my eyes. There's brain chunks all over the wall. And then I get to point number two and I look up and it's 1225 and I'm thinking to myself, wait, this is a three point sermon. I've still got another point to preach and I've only got five minutes. It's like time is failing me. And then I remember what church I'm a part of, Compass Bible Church. And oh yeah, Pastor Bobby, he's preaching in the main service. And that guy always goes long so I can go long and I feel good. But the writer of Hebrews, he says, time would fail me to tell. And then he lists off six characters, just rapid fire. He says, of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. And then notice this, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. Here the writer of Hebrews is, and at the end of this chapter, this hall of faith that we've been studying, where he's been going through different characters, showing how they lived their lives by faith. They were walking one step at a time, making decision after decision because of what they believed about God and his word, not by sight, not by what they thought, not by what they felt, not by what they were seeing other people do, but because of their belief in God's word. And the writer's been showing us so many different characters, and now here he is coming to the end of this chapter and he just, boom, really quickly gives us six different characters. And time would fail me to tell you of all of these six different characters. And, and, and you best believe that I want to get into each one of them, but I can't. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to give you the scripture reference for each of these six characters. And I'm going to ask you to go and look up these scripture references on your own or with your small group even this week and to study them and to, and to see what God is teaching you from these six different men. So the first one is Gideon. And if you wanted to know Gideon's story, you should go and read Judges chapter 6 and 7. Now, at this time in Israel, they had done, the people of Israel had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so God, as an act of judgment, he brings an enemy nation and their armies to march against Israel. And God chooses Gideon to be a military leader and to gather together an army from Israel to go and fight their enemy nations so that way they can win the battle. And so Gideon, he gets together 32,000 men, this awesome army to go and fight the enemy nations. And it says in the book of Judges that the enemy nations had so many people in their army that it wouldn't even measure up to the sand on the seashore. I mean, an analogy, just basically saying there were so many people in that army ready to fight the battle. And so Gideon, he gets 32,000 men and God, he looks at that army and he says, mm, that's too many people. And so God, he brings the number down from 32,000 to 10,000. And if you're Gideon and you're like the leader of this military, you might be thinking to yourself, wait a second, God, you're giving us less people? I thought you wanted us to win this battle. How are we going to win this battle if we've got less people? And God looks at the 10,000 and he says, hmm, still too many. Let's bring that number down. And so what God does is he tells Gideon to tell all of those 10,000 men to come down to this river and he's going to test the men. And, and the test is, how do the men drink from the river? He, he, he says that some men are going to get down on all fours and they're going to lick like a dog water from the river. 
and other men, they're gonna cup their hands and they're gonna get some water and bring it to their face like a normal human being does. Now, which of the two do you think God wants Gideon to choose for his army? God tells Gideon to choose the men who lick the water like dogs. And you know how many people Gideon ends up with in his army? 300 men. 300 men are going to go and fight an enemy nation with an army that has so many people in it. It's like the sand on the seashore. And the 300 men, they don't even get the best weapons. They get trumpets and torches to go and fight the enemy nation. And when they go, they win. And the whole point of the story is so clear. It wasn't Gideon who was responsible for the victory. It was our great God. The next character listed off here in Hebrews chapter 11 is Barak. And if you wanted to know about Barak, you could go and read your U.S. history textbook because he was president. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Not, not, not that Barak. No, if you wanted to know Barak's story, you could go and read Judges chapter 4 through 5, which again, Barak, he's a military leader. And the nation of Israel, again, they've done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so again, God sends an enemy nation to come against the people and to fight them and, and defeat them. And at, at this time, there's a female prophet named Deborah, a prophetess. And she chooses Barak to be the leader of the, of the army. Except she says that Barak's not even going to be the one responsible for killing the captain, the commander of the other army. She says that there's going to be a woman who's going to go and kill the commander. Which would have been at that time just such a shocking thing. That a woman instead of a, a man, a military leader man is going to go and kill the commander of the enemy army? And that's exactly what happens. And the people of Israel, they win the battle. But it wasn't because of Barak. No, it was because of our great God. And then the next character is Samson. And if you wanted to know his story, you could just listen to the Plain White Tea song, Hey There Delilah. No, again, I, I, I'm just kidding. That's not where you could go and figure out who Samson is. You could go and read Judges chapter 13 through 16. And in Judges chapter 13 to 16, we get the story of this guy named Samson. Now, maybe if you've grown up going to church, you're familiar with Samson because I grew up going to church and Samson as a young boy was one of my favorite characters in the Bible because he had long hair and I thought that was cool. And his long hair supposedly gave him this super strength. And there's this story in Judges where Samson took the jawbone of a donkey and he went and he defeated an entire army by himself with the jawbone of a donkey. And I read that as a kid and my jaw no pun intended, my jaw literally dropped and I was like, this guy is exactly who I want to be as, a, as an adult. And then I read the rest of the story and I learned about Samson's sexual immorality with this lady and how she ends up cutting his hair and he loses all of his strength. And maybe that's what you know Samson for, for his failure. But Samson, in your mind, should also be known for his faith because Judges tells us that it wasn't Samson's hair that gave him his strength. That was just a symbol. It was actually the Spirit of the Lord who gave him strength. And all of the battles that he went and fought and he won was as a result of his trust in our great God. Are you starting to sense a theme here? And then the next character is Jephthah. And if you wanted to know Jephthah's story, you could go and read Judges chapter 11. Now Jephthah is known for his tragic vow. Jephthah made a vow, and as a result of his vow, he ended up having to kill his own daughter. And if that doesn't get you interested in this guy and his story, I don't know what will. You should go and read that chapter this week and learn about this man for yourself. And then the next one is David. David is one of my all-time favorite characters in the Bible. 
besides Jesus Christ. I mean, even my son, Weston David Rulin, his middle name is after this king in the scripture. And I love David so much because he's a young man whose heart was after God's own heart. At a young age, while he's out there tending the sheep, a job that so many people would have looked down on and thought was minuscule and mediocre, he did it with all of his might for the glory of God. And eventually in David's life, there's this Philistine giant, a blasphemer named Goliath, who potentially could have been nine feet, six inches tall. Now I'm an average sized man. And for all of you who just chuckled at that joke right there, yeah, that's not cool. But even as an average sized man, nine feet, six inches, that is huge. And this guy, Goliath, He's out there defying the armies of Israel. Really what he's doing is he's mocking God. And David, as a young man, he walks on to the battlefield and he sees Goliath and he says, enough is enough. This guy cannot keep on blaspheming my God. And so you know what David does? He gets his slingshot out and he stones the blasphemer Goliath. And the whole reason why he did that was so God could get glory because he's great. And then we get Samuel. Now Samuel, he wasn't a military leader like the other five. He was actually a prophet, someone who would go and speak on God's behalf. And he wasn't a prophet to enemy nations. He was actually a prophet to Israel which sometimes can be the hardest people to speak to about God. Your own friends, the people that are closest to you in life. Sometimes it can be easier for you to speak about God to complete strangers than it is to people that you feel close to. But Samuel, he was called by God to be a prophet to the nation of Israel. And when God called him, he went. And you could go and read Samuel's story in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And you could see how God called him and how when God called him, Samuel answered. Now here's the question that I really want to ask you right now. Do you believe that God is still just as great today as he was thousands of years ago when he worked through these six men? Like look just on the next page at Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8. Look at what Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 says. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God does not change? That the same God who used people who weren't great thousands of years ago still wants to use people today who are not great to do great things so he can get the glory. See, in theology, this is actually a doctrine called the immutability of God. The immutability of God teaches us that God never changes. And listen to how the writer of Hebrews explains this in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17, the writer says, So when God desired to show more convincingly, to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose. He guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. See, the scripture teaches us that God, his character is unchangeable, and it is impossible for him to lie. Listen to what it says in James chapter 1, verse 17. It says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. See, you and I, we we cast shadows, and our shadows are always changing. Why? Because we're always changing. But God's shadow, it doesn't change. Why? Because God changes never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so here's what I want you to write down for point number one. Believe God can still do great things. Believe God can still do great things. If God can work 
through Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, all men who were not great people, but did great things so God can get glory, what could he do through you? Once you write that down, I want you to grab your Bible and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. One of my favorite verses in all of the scripture. You've got to turn there and you've got to see this with me here tonight as we're under the stars and as we're considering the greatness of our God together. Let's just think, what could God do through you? And as we turn to this verse and as we read this verse, I just want to set your expectations. Your expectations are about to be blown out of the water. Because what can God do through you? He can do a lot more than you could ever think he could do through you. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 3. Begin with me in verse 20. It says in verse 20, Now to him who is able. Well, who's it talking about here? If you look back up at verse 19, it ends by saying, with all the fullness of God. So we're clearly talking about God here in verse 20. God is the one who is able. Well, what is God able to do? To do far more abundantly. Just think about how the Apostle Paul is using superlative language here in this verse. He's using expressive language. What is God able to do? He's able to do far more abundantly, like so much more than you could ever ask or think. And then notice this right here at the end of verse 20 according to the power at work within. Who does it say right there? Us. You. Me. God is able. He's able to do far more abundantly than all that you could ever ask in prayer or think in dream. And how was he able to do it? Through you. Do you believe that? Like, like, honestly, let me just ask you a personal question. Do you believe that God is able to do far more abundantly than all that you could ever ask or think through you? Now, this word able, I love this word able because in the Greek language, it's dunamis, which is where we literally get the English word dynamite. Have you ever seen dynamite before? I, I hope you haven't. For this sermon, I, I wanted to get dynamite and I wanted to actually bring it out here in the middle of the street in the middle of the night. But then I thought, well, this is probably already conspicuous enough. My neighbors might already call the cops on me for doing this. I don't want to blow up some dynamite in the middle of the street. That's definitely going to get the cops called on me. And the cops called on me in the middle of the night while I'm filming in the middle of the street during the coronavirus crisis. Well, probably not the best thing for me to be in the newspaper during this time. So not going to do that. But let's just think about dynamite for a second, can we? I mean, I don't know when the last time that you thought about dynamite was. Maybe some of you guys have thought about dynamite far too recently. Dynamite, though, when you light that fuse, do you have any question that things are about to go off? No. You know that something explosive is about to take place. Why? Because of the power of the dynamite. It's saying here that God is able That word able is this picture of power, explosion, dynamite. God is able. His power is so much greater than you and I could ever even ask or think. And that power is now at work within you. And why is that power, why has God placed that explosive dynamite type of power in you? Well, it's all explained right here in verse 21. To him be glory. This is why God wants to do great things through a person like you who is not great so he can get the glory. Because when God uses a person like you who is not great to do great things, everyone will look at you and they'll think, how did so-and-so, how did that person do that? God is the reason. He is great. To him be glory in the church. That's where God wants to use you to do great things. He wants you to devote your life to the church and seeing the church get built up. 
and in Christ Jesus. Make him known. Live your life fully for Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God wants to do great things through you. And if this verse doesn't convince you, turn with me to John chapter 14. Because in John chapter 14, Jesus says something that I just got to be honest with you here tonight as I'm sitting under the stars. Every single time that I read this verse, I honestly have a hard time believing it. Look at what Jesus says here in John chapter 14, verse 12. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me, is that you? Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Have you put your faith in him for salvation? If that's you, then what he's about to say, whether you believe it to be true or not, it applies to you. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Now let's just stop right there. Let's time out, pause, throw a flag on the play, Let's just think about what Jesus just said. He just said, if you believe in me, you will do the works that he did. Now, obviously, there's some things that Jesus did that we are incapable of doing. If you're hungry for lunch and you want to feed 5,000 people, you can't take a couple loaves of bread and a couple of fish, pray over them, and the food just automatically going to start multiplying. I know some of you guys broke high school students. You wish that you could do that, but that's not what he's saying here. He's saying the type of works that he did, as in not necessarily their quantity, but in their quality, the greatness of what he did. You are going to be able to do things that are great, just like Jesus did. And then, you ready for this? I don't know if you've captured the feeling of being under the stars quite yet, but if you haven't yet, this next line is really going to hit you right where it matters. Jesus says right here, and greater works than these he will do because I am going to the Father. Now hold on a second. Jesus, did you just say that whoever believes in you will do the same works that you did. And not only will they do the same works that you did, but they will do greater works than you did. Jesus, what in the world are you talking about here? Well, he's saying that when I go to the Father, it will be an advantage to you. Because when Jesus goes to the Father, he's going to ask the Father to send the Helper, the Holy Spirit, And the Holy Spirit is going to be placed inside of you. And with the Holy Spirit inside of you, you've got the power. You've got the power to do greater works than even Jesus himself did while he was alive. So I've had the privilege now of working with high schoolers for five years. In the past five years of working with high schoolers, I think that I've diagnosed a disease that I would consider to be far worse than the coronavirus. Now, let me just say real quick, right off the bat, that I don't mean to make light of the coronavirus. In no way am I doing that. As a matter of fact, my wife and I have been taking this very serious for the past month, for the past four weeks, we have been sheltered in place. We've been staying at home. We've been trying to do our best to obey the government and, and abide by the, the laws and the restrictions that, have, that they have placed on us as citizens of this country. And, and we're doing our best to do that right now. But what I mean is the, di- the disease that I have diagnosed in high schoolers over the past five years I think has already infected far more high schoolers than are currently infected by COVID-19. And I think that the effects of this disease we will see for generations so far into the future. The disease that I have diagnosed goes by the initials IDC. And it's a disease that I've seen so many high schoolers right now experiencing symptoms. And maybe you know what I mean when I say IDC. I mean, I don't care. And before you tune me out and you think, oh great, here he goes again. No, seriously, just hear me out for a second. I want to ask you like, just a personal question. Do you care? 
Like, do you care about life? Do you care about why you're here existing? Do you care about your purpose and what God wants to do through you? Because you might have heard everything that I've said so far in this sermon. And we looked at Ephesians chapter 3 and John chapter 14 and the six different characters in Hebrews chapter 11. And you might see how I'm trying to get you fired up to go and do great things for God and His glory. And at this point in the sermon, you might be feeling like, yeah, but I just don't really care. And man, I think that that is such a tragedy. It is such a tragedy that right now there are so many high schoolers who are not living, they are existing. They are living their lives with no purpose. They have no drive. They have no mission that they have given their lives to fulfilling when Jesus has given you a mission. If you are a disciple of his, your mission is to obey all that he has commanded you by faith. That's, that's your whole mission. And do you care about that? See, here's what you have to understand. You, and, and myself included, we have one life. And you get one shot at this life. With each day that goes by, you only have one opportunity to live those days. You get one shot at high school. And man, let me just talk to you seniors for a second. Haven't you learned that during this trial? Haven't you started to understand that? I mean, two months ago, did you think that you were done with high school? No, nobody was thinking that. And now you seniors, you're never going back to your high school. And you'll never get that time again. Please, just hear me out for a couple of minutes. I want to ask you, please don't waste your life. Write that down for point number two. Don't waste your one life. You get one life. You get one shot at it. And, and, and I just got to say that when you cross the tape and you finish this life and step into eternity, I know that you are going to wish that you did not waste your life. And so what are you doing with your life right now? Are you living to fulfill the purpose that Christ has given you? Or are you just existing, doing what other high schoolers do, just trying to get by day by day, wasting the time? Please, don't waste your life. You get one shot at it. And when you cross the tape, when you step foot into eternity, what is your life going to have to show for it? Go with me to the book of Joshua. Yeah, that's right. Joshua. Are you on Team Joshua? Hey, let's all get our fists in the middle. <laughs> yeah, are you on Team Joshua? Are you reading it with us? Man, we read something this past week in Joshua that was so encouraging to me. Joshua chapter 14 is where I want you to turn right now because we read about this guy named Caleb. And Caleb takes us all the way back to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 13 and 14, when Moses sends the 12 spies to go and scout out the promised land of Canaan. And if you remember that story in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, it says that 10 spies, they bring back a bad report. They say, hey, there's giants there. There's no way that we'd be able to take the land. There's no way that we're going to get it. But there's two guys, Caleb and Joshua, who say, we can take it, let's go. If God is for us, like Romans 8 says, who can be against us? But the people, they freak out because of the, the bad report of the 10 spies, and so they don't go into the land. And out of 600,000 people in Israel at that time, only two get to go into the promised land, Caleb and Joshua. And here in Joshua 13 and 14, Joshua, as the leader of Israel at this time, is leading the people of Israel into the promised land. And they're conquering the Canaanites. They're taking over kingdoms. They're destroying kings. And now Joshua is 
distributing the land to the different tribes of Israel. And guess who stands up and say, hey, can I get some land? Caleb. The same Caleb that was one of the spies all the way back in Numbers 13 and 14. And look at what happens here in Joshua chapter 14, verse 6. It says in Joshua chapter 14, verse 6, Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, in Kadesh Barnea concerning you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly follow the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am this day 85 years old. This boy is getting up there. And look at what he says in verse 11. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. Now I'm gonna to suggest to you that I think Caleb is the original Captain America. I mean, what are we talking about here, dude? You're 85 years old and you're just as strong then as you were when you're 40 years old? I mean, what are you juicing on? This guy is... This guy's on another level. And look at what he says in verse 12. So now, give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim, which were the giants, were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. So here we go. We're going to distribute the land to the tribes of Israel. And there's a specific portion of land that has giants in it and it's fortified cities. And guess who stands up and says, that land, yeah, I'll take it, the 85-year-old. I mean, here he is at the end of his life, and what does he say? Hey, give me the easy land. Give me the comfortable land. Now that I'm old, give me the land where I could kick up my feet, and I can relax, and I can retire, and I could just chill out until I die. No, even as an 85 year old, he says, hey, give me the land where there's giants. Give me the land with fortified cities. Let's go. If God's with us, we'll take it. That right there is faith. That right there is a person who is spending his life well. He's not wasting his life. And this is an example for you and me, you have a decision to make today as a young person. How am I going to spend my life? Am I going to spend my life all out for the glory of God by faith every single day, ready to go and do whatever he tells me to do? Is that the decision that you're going to make here today? That even when you're 85, if you live to be that long, you're still ready by faith to do whatever God is calling you to do. I read something in Proverbs the other day, a verse that I really wanted to share with you guys. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 10, because in Proverbs chapter 10, there was a verse that I read that as I read it, I just thought that this verse went so well with what we were going to talk about this weekend in our sermon here on this video YouTube channel. Look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 7. It says in Proverbs 10, verse 7, the memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. And I love what it says right there. The memory of the righteous, the people who lived righteously, the people who heard what God said and they obeyed him, just like Jesus, like we were just talking about, your purpose is to obey all that Christ has commanded. If you go and do that, that's righteousness. Yeah, the memory of those people after they died, it's a blessing. Man, I just want you to think about it like this with me. When you die and you're 
long gone and there's people sitting around a campfire and your name gets brought up, who's going to sit there and think, oh yeah, man, that person, what a blessing they were. Oh yeah, remember so-and-so? Man, remember what they did for God? Yeah, it was wild. Dude, I'd never seen something like that happen before. Yeah, they got this idea in their mind one day when they were reading the scripture about this thing that they could go and do for God and they set their heart to it and they wholly followed the Lord their God and they went after it until it was accomplished and God used that person who wasn't great to do great things so God could get the glory. Yeah, you remember that person? But then it says the name of the wicked, it's gonna rot. Like when they die and their body is buried, so will their memory. How do you want to live your life? Do you want to live it doing great things for God? See, I just want to ask you this question. And it's what I've been thinking about during quarantine. And it's what I've been praying for you in response to this sermon. If there was a united version of Hebrews chapter 11. Would your name make the list? Like, just think about that for a second. If we were to think about our history and what we've seen God do in this ministry, you know, we've been around for a short period of time. We're only five years old, but even in our short history, we've seen God do great things things through people who are not great. And if we were to make a, a Hebrews 11 hall of faith, would your name make the list? What are you going to do by faith? You know, over the past five years, we have seen God do some great things through some people who just honestly weren't that great, but he used them so he could get the glory. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm not a great person, but I've seen God do great things. I didn't grow up going to church, um, but my, my whole life I thought that because I believed in God, because I believed that He was real, that is, and because I was a good enough person, that I was going to heaven. Really, my whole entire life was all about me. In sophomore year of high school, Shane Rulin, same guy you guys know, came to my school, invited me to Compass Bible Church. I went to Awakening, heard the gospel, and God saved me that very day. A lot of things changed after I got saved. In fact, everything changed. One of the biggest things is that I wanted everybody at my school to know the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ that saved my soul and that I knew could save their soul as well. So I talked with Shane. And I started this Christian club that you guys might know of as the United Christian Club. At the Christian Club at Ocean View High School, I saw God do far more abundantly than I could ask or think. I went from a guy who had never read the Bible before, and then I was going up there, and through the Spirit, I was teaching the Bible. I saw my own younger brother get saved. Hi, my name is Jason. I'm not a great person but I've seen God do great things. I did not grow up in a Christian home. And before I was a Christian, my life was all about my image and glorifying myself. Just before I got into high school, my best friend and my older brother, he got saved and said that he became a Christian. Not really knowing what this was all about, I was interested and I decided to go to this church called Compass Bible Church. There, I began to hear what the gospel was, and hearing that if I repented of my sins and I placed my full faith in Jesus Christ, that I could have eternal life in Him. I knew that this was good, good news that I needed. I went to this sermon called Jesus Saves, and at that time, Jesus opened my eyes and saved my soul. God made it very clear that I needed to not deny myself, and I needed to live for Him and His glory. And it led me to doing something that I had never expected to do be the president of the United Christian Club. And I began to see an amazing work of the Lord. God began to save souls at Ocean View High School. Now that I'm in college, going to Biola University, I've seen God continue to do great things. This year, me, this girl Kate Gonzalez, 
who actually got saved at Ocean View High School when we were doing the Christian Club there. We started this Bible study in my apartment and then every Monday we study the law together. We see people start coming to our church, getting plugged into the small groups, start serving. We see God building His church. God continues to do His great work. Now I attend Concordia University and the Lord has blessed me with an opportunity to even lead a Bible study with a group of friends. And through that, I've seen people learn more and more about the scripture, people being convicted about their sins and wanting to change their life in Christ. So I just wonder, what could God do through you? Hey, if you're watching this sermon right now with a group of people, here's some questions that I want you right now to discuss with those people that you're with. If you're not watching this sermon right now with people, think about these questions. Write down your answers, and then I really do, I hope and I pray that you will join a digital small group this Thursday. And if you haven't been to one of our digital small groups over the past month, here's my email. You can email me and I will get you plugged in to a united small group because we want to do life together. We want to be united. Hey, I, I love you guys and I am so excited for the day when God unites us back together. But until that day, let's keep walking and let's walk, not by sight, but by faith.